When the plane was on the runway, Bond walked round to his car and climbed into the driver's seat. He pressed a switch under the dash. There was a moment's silence, then a loud, harsh howl came from the hidden loudspeaker. Bond turned a knob. The howl diminished to a deep drone. Bond waited until he heard the Bristol take off. As the plane rose and made for the coast, the drone diminished. In five minutes, it had gone. Bond tuned the set and picked it up again. He followed it for five minutes as the plane made off across the channel and then switched the set off. He motored round to the customs bay, told the AA that he would be back at 1.30 for the two o'clock flight, and drove slowly off towards a pub he knew in Rye. From now on, so long as he kept within about a hundred miles of the rolls, the Homer, the rough radio transmitter he had slipped into its tool compartment, would keep contact with Bond's receiver. All he had to do was watch the decibels and not allow the noise to fade. It was a simple form of direction finding, which allowed one car to put a long tail on another and keep in touch without any danger of being spotted. On the other side of the channel, Bond would have to discover the road Goldfinger had taken out of Latuque, get well within range and close up near big towns or wherever there was a major fork or crossroads. Sometimes Bond would make a wrong decision and have to do some fast motoring to catch up again. The DB3 would look after that. It was going to be fun playing hare and hounds across Europe. The sun was shining out of a clear sky. Bond felt a moment's sharp thrill down his spine. He smiled to himself, a hard, cold, cruel smile. Goldfinger, he thought, for the first time in your life, you're in trouble. Bad trouble. <laughs> I think you're a sexist, misogynist dinosaur. A relic of the Cold War. Shaken, but not stirred. 007 reporting for duty. These are the 00 Files. Welcome to the podcast of the 00 Files. My name is Don, and you are about to listen to my interview with the wonderful Matt Bunnell. Now, that name might not automatically ring any bells, so I'll briefly explain who Matt is and what you can expect of this interview. If I had to choose one social media platform, Twitter is by far my favorite. I find the interaction with the others fun and quick, and it's so easy to meet new people and follow current affairs. I mean, I've used Twitter to reach out to people like Anthony Horowitz and Charlie Hickson, and more recently authors Matthew Parker and Kerry Edwards. And Every now and then I'm confronted with a brilliant Twitter account in the world of James Bond. For instance, Jealous006, which is an account writing as Alec Trevelyan. And it's so funny. He's always blaming Boris for screwing up something. And then there's the account, The Bubble Stickle My Tchaikovsky, who points out many idiosyncrasies in the Bond universe. And then there are two accounts which are run by Matt Bunnell, and we will be talking about those and more because Matt is not just a 007 aficionado. He is a massive fan who put a lot of time and research into the Fleming novels. So you've just listened to a page from the book Goldfinger, published in 1959 and read by the soothing voice of Hugh Bonneville. And it's the part that describes how Bond is following Goldfinger through France, or actually is just about to follow him. And this, this mapping out of locations from the Fleming books, that's something Matt has done extensively. And that's not all. He also tried to create some sensible timeline or continuity of all the adventures in all the Fleming novels. And then he tweeted these as if he was James Bond from Universal Exports and actually living through those adventures. So I reached out to Matt and I asked him if he'd be up for an interview, something he normally doesn't really like to do, but luckily, he agreed, and we had a lovely chat via Skype, and we were able to share our passion for Bond and just have a good time. So I really hope you enjoy our conversation. So here it is.
Welcome to Matt Bunnell to um, the Double O Files. It's uh, lovely to talk to you. And I really want to thank you for taking the time to, to have this interview. And I understand you're a very big literary James Bond fan and you've created and shared quite some unique stuff online. So uh, I'm looking forward to delve into that. But uh, before, we, uh, before we do that, I always start with uh, a few introduction Double O questions. So Matt, okay. are you ready for those? Let's go for it. Okay. So the first one is, which Bond film have you watched most recently and why? Um, Got to be Licensed to Kill. Licensed to Kill. It's the 30th anniversary, isn't it? So, yeah, it um, is. yeah. And this is, in my view, I think it's a really underrated film. Of course, people can say, oh, it's just another lethal weapon, 1980s American type uh, action movie. But, you know, Dalton's Bond is the closest we've probably ever had to Fleming. And the film, you know, is a fantastic pre-title sequence, the really good title song. Sanchez is a good baddie, I think, you know, solid Bond girls. The plot is sort of believable as far as Bond movies go. You know, <laughs> some about outrageous plots sometimes, but the plot is pretty re believable. And this sort of revenge mission, Bond going rogue for the first time. And we've maybe seen that too many times since, but... Uh, Good pacing in the film, stunts are good. Of course it isn't perfect, you know. What, what would you change? Well, Truman Lodge, you could probably lose him, and Professor Geo is a bit silly, isn't it? Really? The soundtrack is pretty dodgy. Ah, um, that's interesting. You, know, you pick some things that I really appreciate in the film. But... Did really? Okay. So, I mean, everybody's got a different view, haven't yeah. they? But, um, <laughs> Timothy Dalton's hair, what is going on with the hair in the second part of the film? Where this, this is just don't mind thing. the hair. I don't, why does everybody have a problem with the hair? It's just Big issue with the hair. <laughs> but, um, but hey, you know, and this was the film that, you know, in the early 90s, right, I had this on VHS video. And there was no bomb movies in the pipeline. There was all this transact, there all this uh, legal dispute between MGM and about the who owned the sort of bond rights and so on. And uh, you'd watch the movie, and the end of it would say James Bond will return. And I always kept thinking, you know, really? Yeah, I, I really want that <laughs> promise to come true. And what's yeah. going to happen? And then a few years later, Bosnian announces the new Bond, and yeah. That was good. That was really good. So did you watch this in the cinema? No, no, I didn't. I, no, I just watched it. I was traveling and I watched it on my iPad. But uh, yeah. So that's was... not really the big screen then? <laughs> not really the big screen in terms of things. But, uh, and this was one I couldn't watch on the big screen when it came out because in the UK it was certified as a 15 certificate. You have to be 15 years old and I wasn't old enough to see it. So oh, that's a shame. it's the only one that I haven't seen at the cinema yeah. when, it, when it came out. Yeah. But I believe they have uh, a few showings in London uh, this year yes, as well. Yes, I believe so. Yeah. Well, you just enjoyed it on your iPod. I, 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 when I, I asked the question, I was just thinking, maybe I should ask you, which Bond novel have you read most recently? And why that one? Oh, um... Do you keep rereading them? or? Yeah, but I, I, I think sometimes rereading them, but also it's fun. The audiobooks are quite fun as well sometimes. Mm -hmm. And then you, it's it's a different thing, particularly if you're traveling, it's it's quite good to So which uh, one have you listened listen to? to? Most recently, Thunderball. Thunderball by Jason Isaacs? Read by J but No, read... actually not. The one read by... Ooh. Simon Vance? Simon Vance is also called... He's also got another name as well, Robert somebody or other, but uh, uh, Robert Whitfield. Ah, right. He also he yeah. also trades under that name, but yeah. So Simon Vance, and um, I think he's quite he's quite interesting. Uh, they do give a bit of a different perspective to reading the book, and sometimes you pick up things that you don't necessarily pick up when when reading the novel. So that was quite a, quite an interesting. What way I really of, like uh, about audiobooks is that it's really a performance. Yes. So you have an actor that puts emotion and emphasis into dialogue that if you read it, you might not do the same thing. Yes. So, so you, you get that little bit of extra or of something course. else completely that you don't agree with, but you know, <laughs> <laughs> whatever. Okay. Well, yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Let's move on to the next uh, yeah. question. If you could play any character in the next James Bond film and they're currently filming, which part would you love to play and why that part? <sighs> well, I think I have to appreciate that my skills as an actor aren't really top notch but you know i remember you watch the roger moore films and you know there's in sardinia there's the guy on the beach and in 
Venice, there's a guy in St. Mark's Square. And in Cortina, there's the guy who's enjoying his glass of wine. You mean Victor? In the resort. This is what I see my role as. <laughs> I could have a recurring cameo role <laughs> in the next sort of five Bond movies as the guy sat enjoying a glass of wine when there's some Bonds causing some chaos in the background. Yeah, that sounds really good. You don't yeah. have to do that much. And you immortalize yourself. You can be an actor that is in different Bond eras as well. You can yeah, transcend I, the Daniel Craig era. And then I could be some sort of ambassador for Aeon as well and get some sort of uh, profile that way. So I think that would sort of work really Excellent well. Excellent yeah. choice. Excellent choice. Yeah. Okay, so last question. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I know the answer. But if you could either interview Ian Fleming, Broccoli mm -hmm. and Saltzman or John Barry, who would you choose? Why? And what would you ask? Well, so of course, it's got to be Fleming, hasn't it? Yeah, um, yeah. There are some biographies of him, but there's very few sort of TV or radio interviews of the guy. True. You know, so it's, it's quite difficult to, you know, what you hear, what you read about him is really what other people have written, really. We, we do know that Christina Royale, he sat, he sat down to write it because he's going to get married and he needs to take his mind off uh, off that. And and obviously he also had some um, his mind on sort of making some money out of uh, being a novelist. So, but I would really be curious to know, you know, did Bond ever become a big burden for him? You know, there's a lot of people talked about, oh, he, was, he tried to kill off Bond a number of times mm -hmm. and, he, and he kept bringing him back. Was that really true or was that just the sort of Fleming's way of trying to keep the or his audience engaged? And I'm currently reading this book, The Battle for Bond. I don't know if you've Yeah, by Robert read Sellers. This one. Yeah, exactly. And it talks about the uh, this trial that happened, you know. Fleming's in court, accused of plagiarism. You know, he's he worked with a number of people on the storyline for a Bond movie. It didn't work out, so he turns it into a book. Mm -hmm. This became Thunderball. Yes. And he didn't credit the people he probably should have done. Yes, he should have. And I would really like to know what his side of the story was. You know, why why did he went down that route? Did he not think? Did he not consult with people? And really, you know, did that really impact on his health? He died sort of, the whole trial, know, six you months mean. after, didn't he? After the trial. He, he, yeah. Six months later, he died at 56 or something like that. I mean, Well, it didn't help, course, probably, yeah. And probably 60 cigarettes a day and a bottle of spirits mm. or whatever he was drinking <laughs> didn't help either. No. But, uh, it wasn't the healthiest yeah. of men, no. No, no, not at all. Not at all. No, well, eggs, yeah. But, yeah, there, there are books out there that, that try to come up with answers. And I believe even Robert Sellers in The Battle for Bond writes about Fleming probably just didn't realize he had to attribute uh, co-writing mm. to Jack Whittingham or uh, Kevin McClory just because he is upper class. It's his character. Yeah. I'm used to getting my way. I write this book. It's my ownership. Deal with it. And I, I, so it, a bit hubris. I like that uh, word. Yeah. It's, uh, he also uses that word in himself in Casino Royale. It's like he's overconfident. Um, nothing can touch him, probably. He also has some trust in his friend, I guess, in Ivor Bryce as well. So yeah, but you know, it's things can get pretty brutal when there's there's big amounts of money at, at stake. And yeah. of course, you know, at the time Bond was becoming this big movie hero, lots of money flying around, and yeah, I guess people were, time, yeah. were uh, trying to uh, make something out of it. Yeah, well, that worked. Okay. That happened. So, thank you. Uh, we'll, we'll get back to the introduction. No, not the introduction. We'll get back to the closing double O questions at the end. But okay. first, um, I'd like to know, how did you become a James Bond fan? Okay, so we go back to 1983. So my dad gives up smoking because he wants to buy himself a video recorder. Okay. And one of the first movies he recorded off TV was Live and Let Die. Okay. So I would have been, what, seven years old. I was hooked immediately, you know, and then in the summer... Uh, a few months later, we were on a family holiday in Wales, and my mum takes me to the cinema to watch Octopussy. All right. I remember watching this, and I remember the bit in Octopussy when Roger says to the girl, I'll see you in Miami. Yeah. And I didn't actually know what Miami was. Ah. I thought it was his something or other, you know, rather than a place. Yeah, um, exactly. <laughs> but I, and I remember thinking everybody laughed in the cinema, and I was like, oh, what's going on here? But uh, And it took me sort of three years to sort of catch up with the films as they were shown on TV, you know. I guess from that, the books are a natural progression from the films. Yeah, so you started with the films. I think most people do. Yeah. You, you, you watch the films and then after a while you think, well, wait a minute. Well, how does this whole thing start? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Okay. So what is it about 007 that pulls you in? What is it that grabs you, that you like? 
I guess you know the films have always been part of my life, really, from from being a child, and they're repeated on TV quite often. And you do, you know, I find myself watching, you know, I'll just turn the TV on and I'll watch the second half of Moonraker or whatever because it's just on. But the films, you know, it's escapism. They don't take themselves too seriously. You know, it's quite difficult to compare what the, a movie like Doctor No with a movie like Spectre because you know they're totally different eras. But you know, each Bond movie of its time tries to be pretty up to date, and in terms of the stunts they're using and the the themes they're talking about. So they try to move with the times, but a, the same way, trying to retain some of the sort of classic elements. Mm-hmm. You know, they've got a formula that they sort of stick to to a degree. And I think that seems to do that. Well, it clearly works, doesn't it? As for the books, though, you know, they were set in an interesting time in the world. It's interesting to see what the background was, as you as you said, Don, you know, what, where, where did this all start and where did this come from? And it's really interesting to sort of, uh, I wanted to sort of learn a bit more about where did Bond come from and, you know, what's the difference between the book character and the uh, and the cinema character, because there are differences. And, well, major um, differences, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and of course, you know, some of that's because it's the the, the movies and things they need, maybe need to be a little bit more um, toned down. But and also the times change as well, and um, you know, we've got some things that work for you know, you've got Moonraker the novel and Moonraker the movie. Mm-hmm. You know, they're they're set what twenty five years apart, but they could be a thousand years apart in terms of of how it is because the world changed so much in that period. Yeah, true. And now again, so um, the films, it's, it's interesting that you said that, that the films sometimes need to be toned down because I think the general consensus is that they hope the films don't take themselves too seriously anymore because we're kind of sick and tired of Bond moping for, throughout the yeah. entire film and being um, depressed. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's probably, yeah, you've probably gone a little bit too because I was really wanting Daniel Craig and I love Casino Royale because it was such a... Um, it was a bit more of a serious film, mm-hmm. and it was more. It was very much more sort of Fleming esque than uh, some of the later Brosnans, particularly Down of the Day. Mm-hmm. But maybe now we've gone too far and just need to take a step back again. So it's always like a pendulum just going back yeah, and I forth. Yeah, I think so, and isn't forth. it? And we, we saw that, and it, I think we've seen that all along yeah. in terms of the, you know, you see the, the Connery films, and then you go to a, a very, very sort of serious and imaginary Secret Service, and then goes back. Diamonds are forever. Oh, very, those are worlds crazy. apart. Those two. Yeah, and then yeah. gold diamonds. It, Live and let die. Much more serious yeah. again. Golden gun. Yeah, and that, it it just swings. And then you know, Moonraker, very very out there. Yeah, for your eyes and then only. They bring it right exactly. back again yeah. with for your eyes only. So it has changed. It's gone. This has happened all the time. Yeah, but let's see what happens. With Bond 20, uh, 25. Five? We don't have but, a title yet, but by no, the time no. this comes out, we might have. I don't know. Well, yeah, but uh, yeah, well, let's see. Let's see. I still think it's going to be Shatterhand, but who okay. knows? Well, we'll we'll know in um, in a few months probably. Mm-hmm. So I think it's interesting to hear that you are a big fan of the films. But when I uh, started this interview, I said that you have created and shared quite some unique stuff online, and you focus mainly yeah. on the books. Mm-hmm. So I'll, there are three things. Uh, wait, let me get this right. There are four things <laughs> that I actually want to talk to you about. So right. you have a couple of Twitter accounts, um, yeah. you have a blog, and you put me onto an amazing book that I'd like to talk to you about. But let's yeah. first start with. It's a Twitter account, but it's basically, it's a map. I think the Twitter account is at Bond Maps. Yep. And you have created a Google map. Yep. And you placed all kinds of markers and lines and pinpoints and information and everything. And it has a massive URL. I cannot... I cannot (laughs) speak the URL out loud, but I will put it in the show notes. And I urge all our listeners to have a look at that map because it is vast it's comprehensive it's amazing and what you did is you mapped out the literary world of all the james bond books and i believe the flemings right yes you stick to the to the original canon yes and you have over a thousand references there yeah how much time did you spend on that probably yeah a crazy amount of time um (laughs) i I do quite a bit of traveling with work so there's sometimes you sat on a plane or something like that and um you don't always want to do work stuff so uh (laughs) Uh, I, it has been lists. a way of passing the time yeah. sometimes. Yeah, there's a. I think what what I tried to do was try and see can we plot all the not the location, not only the locations where Bond goes to, but everything that's if there's a place mentioned in the Bond book. Let's see if we can if it was really there, and if it is, let's try and map it. So if so there's any reference, 
any reference to any sort of place, building, not cities really, because then they were, they were a bit too obvious, but any... Uh, specific any location. Specific location has got a pin. The group by each novel and then for some of them i've sort of tried to just describe exactly what's happening and some have photos linked and so on so, so uh, i think it's twenty five thousand views so far people but, have sort of bothered to look at this map which seems crazy to me but but why why Do, <laughs> <laughs> what made you think this is a good idea <laughs> well i don't know i think it was I, I was reading goldfinger actually and i was looking i was trying to trace the route you know where bond follows goldfinger through sort of france, france into yeah. switzerland you know, I was trying to follow it a bit, and then there's, there's Fleming. You know, he, very lots of detail in these. He, he clearly researched his books quite a lot. Yeah. And you know, we see that a lot of the road numbers have changed. So I was trying to. I had this other found this other old sort of French road map and was comparing the two. And I was uh, this Google uh, My Maps, it's called, and where you can sort of build your own Google Maps. And I, I sort of traced the the route on there, and then I sort of added some of the hotels he stays at on the way, and then. It gradually grew from there and there, you know. And uh, you know, if you look at Goldfinger, you know, I did the golf game, you know, at um, Royal St Marks, as mm-hmm. Fonning calls it, uh, Royal St George's in real life. So I did the sort of pin positions of the golf game, and then it just expanded from there, you know, and went oh Fort Knox. Let's put that on and okay, sure. So you started with it, Goldfinger. It started yeah. with Goldfinger, yeah. Okay, and then you couldn't stop. <laughs> no, no, exactly. No, I just. We just went and did some more books, really, just to to, to see <laughs> how much this is. Because I mean, most of the of the places in the books are based on real locations. I mean, some you know, you've got Doctor Chatan's castle is a clearly a made up location. And... But that's a fascinating story to begin with, because the producers assumed that it was yeah. based on a real place. Yeah. But apparently, there are no castles on the coastline of Japan. Not not in the south. No, no. Oh, not in the south. Oh well. Apparently, there's none in that area of Japan, so maybe okay. maybe there are. Maybe it just made me think: uh, Why would Fleming yeah. come up with a castle on the coastline to begin with? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, but, but and I think it was probably reasonable for the producer to expect that because there's so many other locations are. Actually, Look at Peace Gloria. Yeah, you know, um, with some things though, maybe he didn't really. I, I was trying to find Mr. Big's headquarters in Harlem, hmm. and I tried to tr- trace that back based on how Bond escapes. But in reality, you know, Fleming probably didn't probably place it in one exact place, you know, as as hmm. as, more, as accurately as, as maybe I've expected. So, um, yeah, in the book, it makes enough sense. He just has to get out of Harlem and back. Yeah, to his yeah, hotel. of course, of course. But yeah. I just wanted for yeah. completeness. I wanted to try and sort of place it on my my. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. And you know, it's quite good. You know, sometimes you can use things like Google Street View as well, and to to help you. Oh, exactly. Try and, look at and it really. But that doesn't work around Fort Knox, by the way. So presumably, the okay. U.S. government have blocked some sort of access for security reasons so you can't look at it no in you street can't look view. at fort knox on street view oh <laughs> it sort of stops about um, it's like a, about two miles all the way around that you can't you can't uh, look at uh well thank goodness we still have the the film then yeah. because they actually uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, filmed the, from the sky yeah i want to uh, slightly apologize because the question was why did you do this i mean kind of making fun of you but i completely understand because <laughs> It's just, it's such a lovely way to delve into the books and try to make them come to life and try to realize uh, what it actually looked like and yeah. then go back into a, a world that existed 50, 60, 70 years ago and try to make sense of it all. And it helps you to comprehend how the story works and how everything goes. So I, I really understand. What yeah, and, and I think other people have done it before. I mean, you see, there's, there's, there's one I was looking at um, based on Sherlock Holmes in london mm. and you know and people have done things like that uh, it, it's not an unheard of thing to do which it, it, i thought yeah. it was a bit of fun and somebody hadn't done something like that before and i think it's quite good to try and just put things out there that people haven't tried before just in another way of enjoying a bit of bond history yeah yeah so what were challenges for you when you started to, to create this <sighs> I think probably he's, he's, he's looking for you don't always 100 percent know if the location was real and we talked about Dr. Chatan's castle, mm. for example, you know, that's probably the biggest challenge, really. Um, and of course, you know, some of these things happened so many years ago. So um, I've got a few, I've still got some outstanding locations that I haven't found yet. Mm-hmm. For instance? Do you- oh, um, Drax goes gambling at a nightclub in um, Cairo, they talk about. Okay. The Muhammad Ali Casino in Cairo. And 
I can't you find any might reference never find it. I'll never find that, okay. probably. There's uh, melodies uh, in um, Tokyo where Bond and, um, and, and Dicko go for, for some drinks. Right. Is that a right. real location? Is it made at one? Okay. We'll pro- probably never find some of these ones at yeah. all. However, what's interesting is, though, you think you've exhausted everything in that book, and then you just pick up and say, oh, I didn't realize I missed that. And there's been yeah. so many occasions where you've read the book again or, or listened to the audio book or something like that and thought, ah. Yeah, you pick up new things every pick, time. Every yeah. time yeah. You, you, you pick up new things. And, yeah. um, you know, I, I guess nowadays maybe once, twice a month I'm adding stuff to the, to the map and just, just small things. But uh, You're tweaking just it. Just tweaking it all the time, yeah. Yeah. Well, I really wish that your map was online when I was a teenager because I spent hours and hours looking for Royal Azul yeah. from Casino Royale, but it doesn't exist. <laughs> um, but I was sure it should be somewhere on the coast. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's really interesting actually because Casino Royale doesn't have the um, the locations at all that, that, that any of the other later Bond books does. It's almost as if Fleming wrote Casino Royale from the top of his head, you know, just yeah. from all his memories and so on. Whereas yeah. all the later books, you know, clearly he went and did site research yeah, and exactly. vi- did proper visits yeah. and and got the detail there. So it, 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 yeah. it, Casino Royale is a bit different to all the other books, and that's I think that's one of the reasons why. Yeah, maybe it's most personal. Yeah, yeah, maybe more personal. Yeah, yeah. but certainly not as researched, perhaps as well as um, as any of the other ones are. Hmm. Do you have any any favourites yourself in terms of of the locations? Oh, favourites. Oh, in terms of the. Bond world, I would say, I don't know. Uh, I mean, I, I've been to Thailand, so that was cool to see that to see um, James Bond Island, and I've been. To I mean, his, the film, but, uh, yeah, the film, uh, and Pizgoria. Yeah. Um, I think from the books, you know, it, it it's different. You know, that they're not necessarily as um, exotic, are they, as as the other um, as the movies? And, it's different, right? Well, because... of course, books aren't as visual, are they? You know, you, exactly. We, we we can we can look at Honey coming out of the iconic moments, like Honey coming out of the uh, the the water in Doctor No, or or even things like in from a view, view to a Kill, where you know, the, you've got the Golden Gate Bridge as this sort of iconic uh, setting for the the final scene. That isn't the same in a book. I had a w- very weird experience uh, a few um, uh, weeks ago when I went to Bern. Yeah. Uh, it was for the celebrations mm-hmm. of Her Majesty's 50th anniversary. And I was standing with another guy, also Matt, a uh, different Matt, mm-hmm. uh, Matt uh, Kettle. I was standing on the balcony of room 411 mm-hmm. where they shot Bond receiving that massive suitcase yeah. uh, that is sent up by, by Sean Campbell. And the other Matt, who was standing next to me, he just went berserk. He looked at the church, that's that iconic shot, mm-hmm. and he said, I like the church. But what's even more appealing to me is when I look down and I look down at the street, that image of the street with the white uh, lines for the cars and everything, yeah. that's, that made such an impression on him. Mm-hmm. That he couldn't really describe it, but that's what film locations yeah. can do to you because they are printed on your irises yeah, or whatever you call it. And you don't have that with, uh, with the book. In, in fact, if you look at uh, locations from a book, I did that um, last year when I went to Sardinia and I looked up a few locations that Charlie Hickson describes yeah. in one of his young Bond novels. And I went there and I really liked it. But you just walk around there and you imagine what would Charlie Hickson have done. Yeah. Not. Yeah, yeah, You, yeah. you can't recognize the scenes from the adventure itself. Mm-hmm. So you're just walking there and you assume, okay, so maybe Fleming looked at this. Maybe he did that. So it's different. Yeah. yeah. But it's nice anyway. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so any favorites? Locations. Besides James Bond Island? I, I don't know. I think, I think New York's quite cool, actually, because it's just because... When I started the project, I'd just come back from New York. Oh, and right. you don't realize quite how many locations are mentioned in New York. He's, you know, he bungles there a number of times, but there's loads of other references throughout the novel. So it's, it's second only to London, really, in terms of what's there. And I think what I need to do now is go back with my map and try and see what, what is still there, because obviously, you know, yeah. things do change. Um, I think Istanbul's quite cool as well. If you get a chance to, every get a chance to go there, both from a movie perspective, where um, you can look at the uh, Santa Fe Mosque and it's exactly the same as Connery Ooh. wandering around. That's nice. Exactly the same. And um, you walk around there and you hear the music, the dong dong music in the background. Mm-hmm. Uh, but 
there's a lot of other cool things as well because you can almost you can follow around where Bond and Karim explore in the in the in the novel. Oh, I'd love so, to do because that because Istanbul that part of Istanbul hasn't really changed so much in um, 50, 60 years. So you can wander around and see things. So uh, yeah, that's quite cool. And, and going down into the uh, the Basilica cistern and, and, and the water that was that was that was pretty cool. Uh, oh, you so. make me so jealous. But I have uh, my my wife has agreed uh, that Istanbul should be on a list. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, we now try <laughs> to combine the family holidays with uh, James Bond locations, yeah. and everybody has a good time. Good. So I'm sure I'll, I'll I'll make it there. But that sounds really good. Yeah. What about Ian Fleming's um, Thrilling Cities? Have you read that? Yes, I, I actually only read this about a year ago, actually. Um, okay. Really, because I was hoping it would give me some more insight into some of the locations I couldn't find for my map. You sound disappointed. But it didn't. Uh, <laughs> however, it's really interesting, isn't it? And 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 you can see how, obviously, he used some of the stuff when like Tokyo and Berlin in particular, he, they came into later Bond stories. That was quite good. And I, I think the problem is that as a travel, if you just read it as on on its own, it's very dated now. You know, the, the world's changed so much. But it's a time capsule. It is a time capsule. You know, it's very, very interesting. And of course, you know, if you're a Bond fan, it's a bit of fun to read. Mm. Well, I haven't yet. So um, I, I tried to focus on the biographies mm -hmm. this year, 2019. I've tried to, I tried to read one biography a month. Mm -hmm. So maybe uh, next year I'll, I'll delve into I think, some of I, the I actually think The Diamond books. Smugglers is probably better, actually. And I read that one right. as well. And he, did that come before or after Diamonds Are Forever? I think, I think it after, was, right? ooh. But he combined a lot of the, the research, research. Yeah, a lot of the research yeah. is the same, yeah. Um, yeah. So um, it's, uh, and that was good. That's, that's quite, dis and that's, of course, more of a true story as well. So um, that was. Yeah, I'll, I'll definitely look into those. That was now, what I really like to do on your map is to zoom out mm -hmm. and just see where are all the markers. Mm -hmm. So if you have the entire world on your screen, you can just see that most of the locations that Fleming mentions yeah. are in the UK. Yeah. West Europe yeah. and the coasts of the US and obviously the Caribbean area yeah. mm -hmm. and, and Japan. But that's it. Yeah. I think Africa is pretty much empty, as is Australia. Mm -hmm. And um, what do you think was Fleming's view on the world if well. you just base it on that? Because <laughs> well, that's where stuff of happens. Course. I, oh, I have the map open now. Even South America is pretty much yeah, empty. Yeah, of course, yeah. I think it, in those days, of course, we need to remember that much of Central and Eastern Europe was off limits. You know, the Berlin Wall's there, so, you know, you, right. you can't go to some of these places. And so Fleming could only write about the places that he either knew about or places he could actually visit himself. But he clearly had a very sort of Anglo-centric view of the world. And you see this in the books, you know, apart from the British, yeah. if you're a foreigner, the only foreigners you're who come out well, <laughs> you, you're either American or you come from a, a Commonwealth or a British Empire country. Yeah. Um, and even friendly countries don't come out well. You know, Fleming, he says the French, they're all alcoholics, you know, and the Swiss, they're all money focused. <laughs> and this is the thing that, that yeah. I was making some notes on this. And then the bad guys are all the Germans and the Russians and the Italians and the Cubans. You know, you can be an American gangster, but, you know, you're, you're, you're not quite a proper American because you're almost a foreign gangster. And and he doesn't respect these people, you know. And most of Bond's adversaries, he does he does actually respect. Yeah. You know, Mr. Big, Doctor yeah. No, Largo, they're all professional guys. They're very well organized. Yeah. They've got good taste. They, they generally dress well. And but not those American gangs. But the thing is about they sort of mistrust, let's say, of foreigners or whatever he, that Fleming's got. In, in the in the short story, the Hildebrand rarity. And you've got Milton Crest, who's this sort of quite distasteful yeah. character. He's an American. Really. He's American, but he. Well, all he does is criticise foreigners, and this is what Fleming doesn't yeah. like. So he's seeing somebody else doing it, and you know he's dismissing all these foreigners as being not as good as Americans and so on. And this is exactly what the irony is, that Fleming doesn't like well, that. Maybe he understood the irony. Maybe, maybe he, uh, maybe he was had playing. a bit of self-reflection. Yeah. yeah, Yeah, and I think I think there's a clearly... The, 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 his attitude does change as the books go along. And maybe that was because mm. he was had more international audience, and maybe his own... Yeah, you know, the world's changing hugely. Yeah, in that time. what I really like is if you look at You Only Live Twice, Tiger Tanaka is trying to put down the British yeah. and, and uh, say how they have been demoted yeah. or degraded mm -hmm. from the empire of, of years ago. And then Bond's trying to explain that they're still great. We still yes. win gold medals at the Olympic Games and stuff like that. But you can really see that Fleming likes the old British Empire. Yeah, of course, that of the course. The British are rulers and important and stuff like that. Yeah. 
Uh, I'm going over your map now, and I can see that Spain is pretty much empty. Portugal, entire Scandinavia. So it's really, it's quite limited. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And he goes back but, to Jamaica yeah. a lot and New York, and there's only these yes. places that appear time and time again. Exactly. Well, write about what you know. So, yeah, of course. Um, I, guess I think so, that's yeah. good. Yeah. All right. Let's talk about your blog. Mm -hmm. You have your own blog, bondmaps at blogspot.com. And that's also a focus on the locations. And I just picked a few interesting entries there. Mm -hmm. What I noticed is that you really like to map out stuff. For instance, the, the chase from the novel of Moonraker. Yeah. Bond drives, I believe he drives from Kent back to London. Mm -hmm. Or was it the other, the other way around? around. So well, he, both. He, he does both. Drugs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a, there's a lot. Of course, this was a route that Fleming... You know, it's quite accurately described because this is one that Fleming, you know, he li was living exactly. in the south coast of England and he was been traveling to London a lot. Up and down that road. Yeah. Was it easy to retrace those steps? Or I, th I think so. I mean, Fleming, he's, he, I think the, 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 the chase starts in, in Blades, you know, and he, uh, Fleming in the book, it talks about Blades is on Park Street. Well, actually, it's on Park Place, I think the street's called, actually. And I walked down there last a uh, couple of weeks ago, actually. And the, the location of Blades is currently the embassy of the Equatorial Guinea. Okay. And um, the thing is about central London hasn't changed much from the 1950s. Mm -hmm. The roads are still the same and, and so mm -hmm. on. So it's quite easy to, to trace that. One problem I had was finding Drax's flat because if you look at a map today, this is on Ebury Street, but it doesn't, the map doesn't work out properly. But um, it was only that I did some more research that I found out that the part of Ebury Street where Drax lives is actually called Beeston Place today. The street was renamed in the late 1950s, but it was quite cool to be able to, to, to plot that. And then I did more more research on it, just trying to see exactly where the uh, the route went. It's quite interesting when you look at where Drax's location is, though. Fleming himself lived just around the corner in two different locations, both maybe one or two minutes walk away. So, uh, yeah, as you say, you're right about what you know. It makes it a lot more easy. Yeah, of course, of course. Yeah. But sometimes it's quite hard to find some of these locations. And I was looking at the From a View to a Kill story when it's all set just on outside Paris. Yeah. And um, in the book, it talks about the Etoile Parfait, the Carrefour de Curio, and the Carrefour Royale. And these are three um, sort of road junctions. And yeah. even in the book, it says these are the names from the old days. So this is, a, this is a, something written in the 1950s. So you're trying to find mm -hmm. these locations another 50 years later. It was quite hard, but it's quite satisfying when I actually found those things and plotted them, and you can sort of read the story and follow the uh, the route on the map, and that was quite you know, interesting. That's something I'm going to add to my list. I'm going in a few weeks. I'm going for my summer holidays in the area of Paris, mm -hmm. and I have mapped out all the film locations, mm -hmm. but not yet from the novel. So I'm going to do that. I, I love that short story. I think it's really clever. Yeah. So yeah, I I'd like to do that. So yeah. thanks again for mapping that out for me. <laughs> I also saw on your blog, you have made this wonderful poster on the chronology uh, of the events in Thunderball. Yep. And it has all these lines, right? Every person, every character follows a different color and you follow all the different people. You take into consideration the countries, the time zones, the locations. It's incredible. Well, first of all, how much time do you have? Uh, on... <laughs> <laughs> no, like I said, this was a bit of bit of fun, really. What I'd done, I'd seen something, a similar thing that was done for the movie Pulp Fiction. Mm. And if you haven't seen it, well, I guess most of us have seen it, but if you haven't seen the movie, it's got a non-linear timeline. As in, the order you watch the movie is not in the same sequence that the events actually take place yeah. so you start watching the movie at the end and then it jumps to the middle and then to the start and, and, and jumps around all the time and thunderballs are a little bit like that that things don't happen in the same time there's different story threads you know things are happening in different time zones so it was a way of trying to illustrate that and show that on one piece of paper and uh, i thought it was a bit of fun really uh, and i really enjoyed doing it but there's probably I can't really think of any other Bond novel that really works to do that again. Okay, so it's a one-off. Maybe, I don't know. I, I, it was just, again, it was just something I, I saw and I thought, oh, we could, could we, uh, this wonderful thing that this guy had done for Pulp Fiction, could we replicate that in the Bond world? And yes, it works for Thunderball. Yeah, mm, yeah, it worked really Could it work well. for another, another movie? I'm, I'm not sure. Or another uh, novel, I'm not sure. Well, I thought it was really nice, yeah. So something that also comes into uh, your other Twitter account that we'll talk about um, uh, in, in a moment mm -hmm. is that you have a knack for finding and posting old images 
like posters, photos, maps from the old days. Mm -hmm. You find stuff from the 50s, from the 60s. How do you do that? <laughs> Um, is it just Google? Uh, well, you just type see, in there's Google? A, yeah, yeah there's, there's some Googling, isn't there? But uh, it, I think, first of all, you know, this is a period of time that I didn't really know a lot about, really, in terms of history. Mm. You know, it wasn't that long ago. It was the year that my parents grew up in. Yeah. I didn't study it at school. You know, that, that was all sort of finished at the Second World War. So, and of course, it was a big change, as you touched on, Don. You know, it's before World War II, Britain was one of the preeminent powers in the world, you know, with the yeah. huge empire and so on. And that was all going away, you know, and Fleming was clearly struggling with this as well, wasn't he? And even if Bond, you know, Bond saves the day sometimes, you know, ahead of the Americans and the Russians actually see him as the one of the big Western enemies rather than some sort of his equivalent in the CIA. And I was also inspired by watching uh, the TV show The Crown. And that mm -hmm. chronicles the life of Queen Elizabeth II. And the part set... She was crowned in 62, right? Um, no, 53 was the crown. Oh, 53, yeah. So, I, I knew it was at the same time at the beginning of the franchise, just yeah. the, the, the novel, not the film. Sorry, yeah, yeah 53, 53. She was crowned so in 53. She's, yeah. And there's the bits that are set in London in the 1950s, and you think, my God, you know, wouldn't it be amazing to have a, a proper period adaptation of Moonraker? That's all mm. set in London in the 1950s, and it really sort of made me sort of try... I'm trying to visualise how that would work, and then... A lot of this is trying to trying to find these old photos of cars and uh, buildings and locations it was my way of trying to sort of let's try and step into Fleming's world a little bit. What was it like? You know, and a lot of it's for my own amusement. You know, I didn't have a clue what a Simca, a Rond car actually looked like. You well, know, that that's that's one of the things that I really appreciate, because on the one hand, the world that Fleming writes about is very similar to our own world. Yeah. It's all after the Second World War. So Bond takes the train from New York to Florida, or he drives in his Bentley uh, through London. And if you just read that, you assume you know how to visualize that. Mm -hmm. But then when you actually start looking up images from those places, mm. the cars, the train, you realize how different it was. Yeah. And then you realize that was a different world that I didn't realize, I didn't appreciate it fully before yeah. looking at actual photos or, or pictures from that time. So that really helps. Yeah. yeah. And I think you've also, I think there's also one thing that's quite funny for me was when you start looking at, if you Google the Japanese pillow book and you don't quite maybe realize quite how graphic these <laughs> These um, the the pictures. Is it are. like the Kama Sutra? Yes, exactly. From, uh, like you only live twice. Yeah, from from you only live twice. Yeah, and um, because he doesn't know how to have sex. Yeah, exactly. He's, he he's, wants he him, forgets uh, what, he forgets what sex right, is all right. about. So um, Kissy yeah. reminds him, and um, that's in the book. And then of, of course I I didn't have a clue what these things look like. And then you look at them and you think, whoa, that must be really super shocking, particularly in the uh, in the nineteen sixties. Even for someone like Fleming, it was a bit of a womanizer and. Uh, quite a broad-minded So guy. they are quite graphic. Yeah, <laughs> but, but a bit of, bit of fun to, to, to just try and put some colour and visualise these these novels in the way that the movies, obviously it's very, very easy to visualise things, but in, the, in reading a, a page, it's not so uh, not so easy. No, exactly. Do you feel a bit of nostalgia about that period yourself? or I, I, wouldn't, really? I wouldn't say particularly uh, nostalgic, no, but it, it's just interesting, really. It was more because I it's not a, a period of history that I'd ever really studied before. Right. So something else that really helped putting the books into perspective is a book that you actually put me onto a few months ago. It's called Ian Fleming's James Bond, Annotations and Chronologies for Ian Fleming's Bond Stories. And it was written by um, John Griswold, who recently passed away, mm -hmm. right? A yeah. couple of years ago. But thank you so much for, for pointing me into the direction of that book. For everybody who doesn't know this book, it's, it's like a school textbook. It's massive. It's really about the most awesome subject ever. It's everything about the Bond novels. And it starts with a step-by-step high-level chronology of the James Bond books. And Griswold describes how future books influence the events of earlier books. Yeah. Now, currently, I am rereading Live and Let Die because yep. I'm planning to do a series of podcasts on that. And it seems to take place in 54. There are a couple of references in that book that make it abundantly clear it has to be in 54. Mm -hmm. For instance, there's the Miss Orange Blossom 1954, and Fleming also mentions a Russian called Beria, mm -hmm. who was murdered at the end of 53. Yeah. But later on, 
Casino Royale is placed in 51, and Le Villa dies immediately six months mm -hmm. after Casino Royale. So basically what I'm trying to say is the book tries to, to create a chronology of the books, but there really isn't any. Yeah. I, so what do you make of the timeline? I totally agree. I mean, you know, I think Griswold does, this is an insane piece of research. He's done a lot of detailed work on this. Um, but we need to remember that Fleming probably didn't create his own proper chronology for Bond until he'd written he was a few just books. writing. Probably. Well, he, he'd probably written three or four books before he sort of started to think properly about it. But even when he did write the chronology, he didn't stick to it mm. in later novels. And then also Fleming had a habit of writing the book and then sticking in some topical current affairs and news stories exactly. of the time to make his book feel super up to date. But those things directly <laughs> conflict with his timeline. So it's a bit messy, <laughs> isn't it? So I think we have to be realistic and say there isn't really a proper one. I think if you'd said to me, I, I go back to Moonraker and... We talked about the coronation of Queen Elizabeth in 1953. Moonraker, mm -hmm. I would say, is set, it must be set in 1954 because um, it's all on the back of the coronation and Drax writes to the Queen and gives this um, the rocket to, to Britain. Right. And so I, I, my view would be if you stick Moonraker in 1954 and then everything else moves in around that. So because I'm, Moonraker takes a bath for a week. Yeah, it may. After Live and Let Die. Yeah, which is in January. So that kind of, it could it make could sense, it but could then work. But do you have other problems again? Of course, exactly. So Every time you try and find a purpose, <laughs> you find another problem. So the, you, I think you've just got to sort of yeah, he's done a great piece of work, but nobody's going to do. There is no correct answer. So in other words, whatever you prefer, whatever you prefer, and but also yeah, yes. But I think when you read that book though, there is some other fantastic information in there that he talks about. You know, learning about the bridge game in Moonraker and the golf and yeah. golf uh, and Kronstein's the background to Kronstein's chess victory in From Russia with Love. You know, yeah. this guy's done an incredible amount of research. And yeah, what I noticed, and I couldn't believe it, but he tried to pinpoint the location of M's office inside the fictional building yeah. in Regis Park because one of the novels there's a line that the sun shone through the window at a certain angle and then he did some calculations yes. that it must have been that time so it must have been facing the southeast or yeah, whatever yeah, yeah. so that's exactly where the office should have been it's like how do you come yeah, up yeah, with yeah. this and that is a guy yeah. with too much time on his hands but uh, sadly <laughs> he's no longer with us yeah, but it's fun. It's very, very fun to read. Yeah. And um, but I like what you said that you choose something, and you can stick to your own choices, mm -hmm. and also assume that Fleming didn't try to make it cohesive. Yeah. Okay. But anyway, it's still a good book. Do you personally have a particular period in Bond's life that you find fascinating, or a <laughs> uh, specific uh, adventure? Not, not really, but you know, in some ways, you know, Moonraker is my favorite book, and I know the plot's a bit, you know, not not the best, but. It is different because it, you know, there's no, there's no exotic locations. It's all based in Britain. Yeah. He doesn't get the girl. All this sort of stuff is very, very different. But in a way, I like the stuff, the mundane stuff he does. It talks about, you know, Bond and his London life. You know, he goes to the office and he reads reports and he has some sort of shooting practice or whatever. And he's got in the evening he plays cards and he's got these married women he's having affairs with and stuff like that. And I, I like all that sort of boring, mundane detail. You know, we, we still say a bond with this guy who's flying off around the world and killing loads of bad guys and saving the world from a, a nuclear disaster or whatever it is. But there's a lot of stuff in sort of Moonraker, which is what the boring stuff that we all do. Maybe we're not all sort of, you know, gambling every night and having all these affairs to. with married women. But we're, we're going to the office and we've got our mundane day jobs that we, we, we're doing. Yeah. And I think that... that in some ways, that's quite refreshing. Yeah, it makes you feel like like you can do Bondian stuff if it just involves <laughs> going to the office <laughs> or reading reports. <laughs> yes, maybe. Yeah, but we've touched on this a couple of times now. How much time and effort we put into this subject? I mean, you do it when when you're creating your tweets, your your maps, and and all that stuff. John Griswold has done it with his book. I have a podcast. But isn't it strange how much effort we put into this, into mm -hmm. something that's not real? I mean, yes. what is it that drives us to do this? Are we just completely nuts? Well, we probably are, aren't we, really? Because, but I mean, you know, <laughs> you, you see this, you could say the same thing about Star Wars or... Um, yeah, Marvel. Marvel or um, anything, really, you know. It's an interesting thing, as I say, if, if you've grown up with something and you've, you've learned a lot about it and... Uh, 
Uh, and particularly when you can communicate with people who've got a sort of shared interest, that's quite cool as well. Yes, of course, it's crazy. And of course, we could probably all be better doing, you know, raising money for charity or, um, you know, working out in the garden or repainting the bathroom or something. But um, if it's what you enjoy, why not? Yeah, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll I'll keep on going because what you said, I like it. You guys, fantastic. Yeah, no, I don't have an explanation <laughs> either. What I do like is because the character is fictional, but the books are real. Yeah, I mean, there are actual books. The films are real. You can talk about the films. The locations, most of the locations are real or based on real mm -hmm. places. So you can go there. You can. Mm. You also learn something. I, I I've learned so many things about the history of the world or geopolitics from reading the Bond books. Mm -hmm. So it's not just a bit of nonsense. It also has all that yeah. fiction stuff yeah. woven into it. But there's also so much realism to it that just I find it fascinating mm -hmm. that combination, that mix yeah. to absorb all that. Mm -hmm. And like you said, to talk to others about it, it's also about the community to, yes, to reaching course. out and, and what do you like? What do I like? Why is your opinion different from mine? So why are you wrong and stuff like that? <laughs> it's just a bit No, Exactly, exactly. And you put something <laughs> on, I mean, I put something on Twitter the other day, there was some debate about Goldeneye. And I was saying, my God, you know, the thing that ruins the film is the music. Yeah. Eric Serra's music, in my view, is, is the worst soundtrack in, in, the, in, in Bond history. You're not the only one who thinks that. But this guy then tweeted me with quite, a, not, not aggressive, but I think it's one of the best. It's one of the highlights of the movie franchise. <laughs> what? And I thought, oh my God, this is, it's quite a broad, broad church, isn't it? They debunk yep. it sometimes. And there are yep. everybody who likes, you know, and I like, I really love the novels and I really love all the historical stuff, but you know, I'm a Roger Moore fan as well. And I like some of the silliness that goes right. on with the safari yeah. suits and all that sort of stuff. I think we've just got to uh, accept that it's a, it's, it's a broad church and there's lots of fun stuff going on there. And it's all about just sharing. And, and what I really don't like is, is the moment people start criticizing you because you have a different opinion. Yes. But let's not go into that. <laughs> Two more things about this book by John Griswold. Mm -hmm. One, just a bit of nonsense, really. But when's James Bond's birthday? Oh. <laughs> I know it, it, Tiger talks about him born, being born in the era of the rat, doesn't he, in 1924, yeah. but I don't think that works. So I, I don't know. Gris, Griswold says 20, 1921. That's probably good enough for me. Uh, he says 1921. Yeah. Uh, but I, why would Tiger get it wrong? I just think it sounded good. <laughs> Fleming thought the year of the rat was quite amusing. It's a, quite an amusing line. So let's not Nobody's going to gonna the, look it up. Yeah, we're not going to stick to the chronology and the proper timeline Yeah. because this was too good to put in the book. I think that that's, okay. that was his, his view. The year of the rat. The year of the rat. It's all a bit of a joke, really, of to course, Fleming, yeah. right? Of course, yeah. it is, yeah. yeah. So, but assuming it's around 1920, 1921, yeah. he was born, then Griswold has this whole chapter on Bond growing up, being a teenager, when did his parents die, when did he, mm -hmm. he... He lies about his age to get into the army yeah. because of the Second World War, and he goes through SOE training and everything. It's, I think it's fascinating to, to delve into that yeah. bit of Bond history and combine it with real-life events. Mm -hmm. So, but uh, it was the 11th of November, right? For yeah. some reason. Yeah. Was that just random? I'm not sure. I've read something on this. <laughs> I love to know about I, I can't remember what it is. Because, because I know, obviously, Blofeld's birthday is Fleming's birthday. Yeah. And it's 28th of May. Yeah. But there is something with... I can't remember. But... Um, no. Yeah. We'll leave it at that. So, according to uh, Griswold, two books seem to have the most impact on the fictitious life of mm -hmm. James Bond. So, you have From Russia With Love, his fifth book. Yeah. Uh, the Russians are going through Bond's file and they make all kinds of remarks. And the other one is the obituary at the end of You Only Live Twice, which is one of his last novels. There are many inconsistencies. Mm -hmm. So what do you find most interesting? Why? Um, you know, From Russia With Love was the first Bond book I picked up. Oh, um, so you have properly. a soft spot for it. Yeah, and, and I remember reading that scene in, the, in, the, in, the, in the, the office in Moscow when they're all debating the plot and Bond and so on. And I really loved that because I remember thinking, oh, it's like you're almost in the room, you know, you're framing, you used to go into insane detail. And he talks in, in such an authoritative way that even stuff that he's made up sounds believable because mm -hmm. this journalistic style he's got, he can talk in uh, in the way that um, the street is apparently, with the KGB were never at that location yeah. in Moscow. But he, the way he talks about it is, yes, you, you know, you, you absolutely... Why not? Yeah. That, that's yeah. How, how it is. And it's a good scene. It's like you're a fly on the wall. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. But, you know, that there are inconsistencies. We, we we know that. And he didn't stick to this chronology. And, and as time moved on, you see Fleming at all. So I had to play around with the birthday 
because Bond was going to get was getting too old, and he almost like needs yeah. to keep him younger. Yeah, so it's always a bit vague. So it's always a bit vague, and who knows? You know, what was Fleming's health? You know, in the later books, you know, he he had these a lot of these health problems he had with all the, you know the drinking, the smoking, and all the rest of it. Whether that impacted on things, who knows? But yeah, the inconsistencies. I think you've almost just got to accept them, and um, it's it's probably too far down the line now to try and correct things or really explain oh, yeah, some yeah, of them. We, you know? Yeah, we really don't have to. So. I am going through uh, his chapter on Live and Let Die mm -hmm. before uh, starting on the podcast series of that second novel. And I'm going to just use the book as much as I can. I really enjoy it, yes. even though I am fully aware this is not real. Yes. Now, let's move on to um, your fourth uh, subject or the fourth thing that you've created. This is something relatively new. It's a Twitter account and it's at JB underscore Univex yeah. from Universal Exports. Yes. Now, you've started, it's uh, March 2018, that's over a year ago, you started a new ambitious project. What can you tell me about that? Okay, so I love Twitter. I think, you know, it's flawed, but, you know, it's a fantastic place to keep up to date with the news. And one of the accounts I was following was called Real Time World War Two. And what happens is the guy who runs this account, he details the chronology of the Second World War and it, over a period of five years, and he does it daily, as in real time. And the account covers interest, an interesting mix of things. It's not just the big things that happened in the war, but also some of the, the smaller things that happened to the personal things that, re, that maybe only impacted a family or a particular individual. Mm -hmm. And he, I love the way he mixed in. He, he used lots of photographs as well and new stories and stuff just to just to keep it a bit more fun. And I was, I'd sort of done this Bond map, and I was... I'd really uh, reached the end, really, in terms of the the work. I, I was struggling to find any more locations. So I wanted something else to do. So, And I'd seen a few other things on Twitter where people have been tweeting diary excerpts from mm -hmm. biographies, autobiographies of uh, various people who, uh, who died and so on. So I thought, well, could we create something for Bond? So the idea was to create Bond's life in Twitter. Obviously, knowing the fact he's a, some sort of secret agent and we couldn't really disclose that, but sort of have this um, life of this guy who's a import and export merchant who keeps going all around the world and getting into all sort of scrapes. So your Twitter account, James Bond is a secret agent, but he has signed a non-disclosure agreement or something. So. Oh, 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 so, or maybe actually he is an import export merchant and Ian <laughs> Fleming's a fantasist who is basically embellishing Bond's travels with these crazy adventures on the way, I don't know. But what you did is you followed the chronology yeah. as good and as bad as it all holds up. Yeah. And you tweet as if you are yes. James Bond mm -hmm. from Universal Exports. And in May 1951 or 54, whenever you go on a trip to France, yes. because you start with Casino Royale. Yeah. That way you just take us through all the novels yes through tweets mm -hmm. how does that work how do you set about turning a novel into a set of tweets well the, the first thing i did was i had to do my own chronology and i didn't really want to look at i wanted to do that independently from john griswold because he's done a fantastic piece of work but i needed to do it myself so i created a, a sort of chronology of all the books and the short stories and how they all fitted together and then it was a case of going page by page in casino royale and trying to write some tweets trying to stick to maybe two or three tweets a day for um, the sort of background to the, the story and the build-up. And then, obviously, when you've got the main action, typically in a Bond novel, that's only maybe taking place over two or three days, mm -hmm. the, the main novel. So more tweets then and then then action afterwards. But I wanted, uh, you know, I like this thing that this guy done with with the real-time World War II mm -hmm. account. And I wanted to try and put a lot of the historical context in there as well. So let's try and fit in the major news events of the time. So we know Moonraker's set against the coronation of Queen Elizabeth. So let's get that in there. You know, those big world events happening at the time. You've got the Suez crisis. You've got Castro coming to power in Cuba. You've got Kennedy becoming uh, a US president. You know, they're all mentioned in the novels. So I thought it'd be fun to, to, to weave those in as well. And, and maybe also put a few nods into Fleming as well. You know, Fleming was writing the column for the Sunday Times. He was in court with Thunderball. He was... Uh, he was being mentioned, uh, he had a profile in, uh, certainly in Britain. So let's weave some of those things in as well and have a bit of fun. And, and a lot of those things were used to break up the time a little bit between the novels. So you didn't 
one novel didn't flow exactly into the next novel. Mm-hmm. There was a, maybe a, a week or so of break between the year. Uh... Did you have to restrain yourself from tweeting? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I think the thing is what happens is some people are following it. Some people get really into it. And then we're saying, you know, <laughs> And you know, don't you, you mustn't go there, or don't believe this person, or uh, Drax is lying to you, and you that know, oh, you know, people are really getting into it. So um, yeah, it's it, it's a good good bit of fun, and um, people seem to enjoy it, which is um, which is good. Yeah. And and I was a bit afraid because I thought you know maybe you've really got to be a, a James Bond geek to really get some of the stuff in it because some of the stuff is quite. There's a lot of in jokes in there. Mm-hmm. You know, you've really got to have read the books properly to understand them. But you know, lots of people um, do seem to uh, do seem to enjoy it more than you thought. Yeah, at the beginning, of course. Yeah, that's good. But I really like the parts when uh, when it turns quite meta. For, for instance, what you said that James Bond is tweeting about Fleming or the court case, or he's tweeting about going to see From Russia with Love yeah. in the cinema. Is that, wait a minute, <laughs> how does that work? Yeah, but, yeah, well, yeah. exactly. <laughs> but you know something that that's the and I was very I wanted to keep it quite lighthearted and not to, yeah. not super serious because you know we need to respect that you know the. These books are there, you know, they've sold millions of copies and I wasn't going to blatantly rip off all these books. So it was more breaking that sort of fourth wall was something I, I wondered what, what it would be like. But they're the most popular tweets, actually. <laughs> so I think the most liked tweet we had was when he went to watch From Rush With Love. <laughs> and then he comes out the cinema saying, because he's the Bond's brainwashed at the time, so he comes out and saying, oh, this is an unfair depiction of uh, the Russians and so on, you know, they, they you know, it's a bit of fun, really. You know, Fleming. Fleming wrote. I got hold of some news cuttings from uh, Fleming's column in the Sunday Times. I'd sort of put some pictures of those in and say, oh, you know, Fleming doesn't know. This guy doesn't know what he's talking about. I think at one point he's talking about the uh, the roads in London and how they need to be realigned. And so Bond sort of, oh, that idiot doesn't know what he's talking about and stuff like that. Just to have a little bit of a dig there. It's, uh, yeah. Just briefly, you said Bond was brainwashed when he watched From Us With Love. That's because in your timeline, that takes place at the time of The Man With The Golden Gun. Yeah. So he was brainwashed to assassinate M. Yeah. For anyone who doesn't get that. So were there things you didn't want to tweet about from the novels uh, that you yeah, steered clear I mean, of? Uh, yeah, of course. I mean, you've, you've got to say that, you know, some of the, particularly the earlier novels, they don't reflect the current attitudes to sex and race in particular. On your podcast, on when you did the Casino Royale review, I really enjoyed that actually. Thanks. You know, you talk about the sexism there, Bond initial attitude towards Vesper. You know, she's a woman. You know, I don't want a woman getting in the way of my uh, job and my, the job I've got to do here. You know, hmm. and that it's there, isn't it? But let's not. That's, that's not it's quite easy to omit things. Yeah, so let's omit things like, you know, live and let die. Obviously, yeah. there is, there is some, there's some attitude when he's talking about Mr. Big's man. Bond's attitude towards odd job in golfing is terrible, you know. And, you know, <laughs> it's appalling, isn't it? But, but, you know, we have to remember, and I'm not defending any of these things at all because I don't agree with them at all. But these were set 60 years ago and there was very different attitudes in the world. You know, yeah. the world's have come out of a five-year war and there was clearly had very hostile attitudes maybe to people from other countries yeah. because of what had happened in the war. Yeah. Some of the things that had, uh, had gone on, you know, and yeah. I guess the attitude towards odd jobs maybe is a report saying maybe knew somebody who'd been tortured by the Koreans or something like that. And, you know, yeah. it, that was his view of the world. So, um, but, you know, there's no, there's no point to, in going on about that sort of stuff. We you do, don't have you to. You don't no. have to. It doesn't, it no. doesn't, you know, we can admit that and still have a, a perfectly good, uh, yeah. Good fun story. Sure. So what were challenges for you? Was it mainly finding the, the photos and stuff like that? Or um, was it all at the beginning when you were yeah, you know, making a timeline? I, I think the, the timeline was relatively straightforward. Um, okay. I think the, the, the key was what I, did, I didn't want. I wanted to, as I say, wanted to respect Fleming's work. So I didn't want to put all this. I didn't want to spoil. Okay. I didn't no want spoilers? To, no I guess you can't every spoiler, but you know I didn't want the detailed spoilers to go out there. But I also wanted to make it my bond in a way. My bond's this import expert motion. He goes all around the world, you know. But then I thought let's let's make it fun. Like you know, he's the one who's getting used by the women. He's not using the women. The women are using him. And he's like this victim who's always getting kicked out of bed by see, oh, these poor uh, these poor, poor ladies, you know. <laughs> I think the, the one problem I did have at the end was, and I didn't realize this until towards the end of the thing was when in You Only Live Twice, which is the second to, to last novel, mm-hmm. Bond has this amnesia after escaping from Dr. Chatan's castle. Yeah. Uh, but I, I don't want to spoil the end. I don't want to spoil the book. And they, they, they sort of um, 
no spoilers. But you still on the have book, to keep tweeting. I still have to keep tweeting. But how how do I do that? Because Bond's now got amnesia. He doesn't know who he is, so he doesn't know he exactly. he can't actually log into his Twitter account. So we have. So to, how do you solve that? So problem? we solved it with um, creating. So Toro Todoroki had his own Twitter account, and he tweets about the life of himself as a Japanese fisherman. And that was brilliant, and, and that was a b- bit of fun, really. So we, we we went, and that wasn't my idea. Actually, somebody suggested that on Twitter. Actually, which is, oh yeah, that's an insanely good idea because I was really struggling to finish that off. I think um, that was quite uh, that that was a. a I good distinctly day. remember uh, tweeting to Todoroki, "Don't go to Vladivostok. Yeah, it's exactly. a bad yeah, idea. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> don't exactly. do, don't go there." Yeah. So what, what other kinds of tweets or reactions did you not anticipate before you began this project? I don't know about tweets. But I think one thing, just in terms of the studying, when you're going through all the books and making loads of notes and so on, how many times does Bond eat eggs? <laughs> right, I got this right. I've got a note here. He enjoys 34. He has eggs 34 different times, <laughs> right? Every, sing, every book, every proper full-length novel, he re- eats eggs at least once. And Scrambled, preferably. And in through the show, in *Live and Let Die*, he right, and maybe this needs to go in your um, in your review. He eats eggs on seven different occasions in one book. <laughs> so apparently, Fleming was warned by his doctor. You know, you need to cut down on the eggs, and maybe uh, maybe Bond should have done as well. But um, yeah, so th- 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 he, when you find stuff like that, and it was quite funny. And I only realised because it was it was World Egg Day, and people were tweeting about World Egg Day, and it just really struck me. So I just I went through my notes, and he thought, oh my god! So we just did the I did I sent something out with some graphs and something in terms of this is how many eggs Bond eats per novel. And you should it, make another. The poster, I yeah, think. Yeah, we, we should do something. Else. <laughs> Unfortunately, but the, the blog got a bit neglected because of um, yeah, because you, of other things. So uh, you can't do everything. No, you can't right. do everything. But anyway, in terms of people, people like the old photos really as well, particularly the old yeah. cars. Yeah. And I think you you also get the sort of the vintage car community sort of like quite likes that sort of stuff as well. So you know, some random old Peugeot from the 1950s gets some crazy amount of tweets because it, the, the Peugeot Owners Club likes it or something. I think on social media, though, it's quite hard to understand how people react. You know, my daughter talks about it's all about the likes on uh, Instagram and so on, but you can track the followers, you can track the likes, but you don't really know how things have gone on. And, and then particularly is I try to sort of like, in some ways in JB, the Twitter feed is, is a two-way thing, really. You know, I try and respond to people sometimes and uh, yeah. have a bit of fun. But inevitably, and of course, it's also, all, a lot of the tweets are scheduled in advance. So because, you know, yeah. I, I just, you know, I haven't got the time to be doing that all, all day. But when, I, when, it, when it finished the original run, it was like, oh, the amount of feedback I got from people was really nice to sort of say, you know, they really enjoyed it, you know, and um, how much it's meant to them, you know. And, and all I'm doing is I'm just tweeting a few bits out of some 60-year-old books, you know, with a few photos and a few news stories from the time, you know. And um, people say... But it's to really say, appreciated. You know, and I, yeah. I got a really nice tweet from Raymond Benson, who wrote uh, the James Bond... Please do my novels now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, exactly. That's what... uh, yeah. Yes, well, I don't think I'm, I'm... I'm not a massive fan of the continuation novels, so I'm not, but, you know... Well, don't tell him that. But, but no, overall... <laughs> But I think it was really nice to somebody because he, no, this guy, he's he's written the, the James Bond Bedside Companion, which is a great mm-hmm. sort of encyclopedia of Bond. So and this guy who knows a lot about it and he's enjoying it. So I thought that was, um, that was really nice. Yeah, it was. It was really nice. So you have gone through all the Fleming stories now. It, it's done, but it's not dusted, right? I mean, what are your plans for this project? You're not going to do the continuation. No, I'm not going to do it. No. no. Because I quite like the 50s and 60s era. I think what's going to happen is... Maybe C- Colonel Sun? Just no, that one? No. I, I don't know. Don't go well. there. I've only read it. Uh, <laughs> no, I think... Well, you might learn something. Uh, yes, maybe. Um, I haven't got the time. <laughs> I need to see some other things. Well, um, I think what else will happen is JB Univex will get a run, rerun starting in the summer. There are some errors in the first edition that I need to fix. Okay. And I want to make some other tweaks as well because as it, as it went on, I learned what people liked and I need to put some time aside to find some more photos and that sort of thing. But that's the big plan, really. Okay. If you've missed out on these tweets, if you're not a Twitter person, go on Twitter and follow this account. It's at JB underscore Univex and I'll put it in the show notes as well because you're going to start again with Casino Royale. Yes, that's right. Okay. So also, if you don't know the novels that well, this might be a very good way of getting into those stories. Mm -hmm. It's really just a bit of fun. Yes. Okay. So do you have any other plans for the future concerning Um, 007? Well, actually, you know, JB Univex, he likes his food and travel. So I think it's appropriate he needs an Instagram account. 
to tweet his ah. travels. So that's going to launch at the same time as the rerun of the Twitter account as well. Oh, that's so. Really so the, nice. the photos were. I, I don't know quite how it's going to work because there isn't a photo for every single tweet, and there can't be. So no. um, maybe we just did that. The, the, the but um, Instagram. He does seem, you know, he's a bit of a foodie and he's, he likes his travels, so you could see him. But no selfies, probably. No, 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 no selfies. <laughs> but um, you know, you could see him when he's at the airport taking a photo of the plane and. When he's in a fancy yeah, restaurant really taking nice. a photo of his yeah. uh, of his uh, dinner, so we'll do that. I think the, the bomb maps project. I think it's just going to stay online. Right? It'll stay online, of course. But what I'm going to do is try and launch a little bit of an appeal because there's about 30 or so locations that may or may not exist. So let's okay. see if maybe people get the can, community involved can help with some of these things because I've really yeah. probably reached the end of the road in terms of finding any myself. So that's the really that's the real uh, things I want to do, and then finally, I think I've been playing around with Google Earth Studio, and it's a pretty powerful tool and a way of seeing how we can sort of visually uh, use create movie maps right. or moving maps, let's say, rather movie maps. Um, so I'd really like to try and do something with Thunderball in terms of what happens with the, the with the planes and the boats and how everything's moving around the world. So let's see if we can. Uh, do something with that. So um, you have plenty of plans here. It sounds really interesting. Uh, well, let's see. Let's see. I mean, I, I think um, yes. Well, let, let's see what's uh, what we can what we can come up with. Yeah, I'm I'm really looking forward to it. I think you contribute quite a lot to the to the whole community, and I really appreciate it. And I, thank you. I really want to thank you for this chat. I've had a wonderful time talking to you. Thank you, Dan. Now, before we go, I do have a few closing double O questions. Okay. Yeah. Here we go. The first one. If you could go on a date with a Bond girl, who would you choose and what would you do? It's got to be Anya. And we would go to okay. the, the Majava Club in Cairo, you know. Oh, okay. But she has to wear the black and silver dress, though. Ooh. Because... Have you seen that dress in Bond in Motion? Yes. Oh, it's so good. And it's the only bit of fashion from the Roger Mora era that still sort of looks great today, isn't it? So. <laughs> okay, so you want to go to the Majava Club. That's excellent. They have some some fun music there. Yeah, but stay yeah. away from the telephone booths. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, Matt, how do you take your vodka martini? I'm not really into, I'm not really into cocktails, but you know, I remember you, you, your bond is wrong. You know, you shouldn't have it shaken and shaken? not stirred. You should have it. You should have it stirred and not shaken. Really, apparently. I, you know, to be honest, I have no idea. So apparently, I really don't. So, know. Mr. Henderson <laughs> in in the movie, he got it right. He gets it right. It's stirred, not shaken. So, um, I guess that's how it should be. But um, I'm I'm quite sure Fleming has an excellent yeah. explanation why it should be shaken. But yeah, apparently it's better know. for your heart or something like that. Because Fleming's such a health freak that he, uh, <laughs> Mr. You, you know, freak. he's uh, apparently it was it was, uh, it was something to do with how the the ice reacts with the alcohol or something. It's okay. uh, yeah, some well, Let's there. just put it out there as well. You know, if anybody knows why you should either shake or stir your vodka martini or not do anything with it, please let us know. Yes, but you don't particularly enjoy them. N neither do I. Actually, <laughs> I, I just had one up at Peace Gloria. But, but I finished it because I thought I had to. It yeah. made me quite lightheaded. I, I, I'm not. I'm not a massive one for cocktails, but yeah, of course. It, it, every now and again, it's fine. But uh. <laughs> okay. So, is there a particular Bond song or music cue that you like? And I can put that at the end of the podcast. The one I really, the cue I really like is from A View to a Kill. It's called Fanfare. Ooh. And this is the bit where Bond carries Stacey down the firefighter's ladder. Right. And it's the very really, heroic. Really heroic cue. orchestral cue, very dramatic. You know, if it's a What's time the title you... of that track? Because I have to it's look it up. It's called Fanfare. Fanfare, okay. I'll oh, have a word. look for it. And I think it's. I don't think it's actually on the um, soundtrack. It's not on the I soundtrack. Say, oh, you're going to make it, it difficult for me. Okay. <laughs> okay, I'll put that out there. That's a good call. I haven't heard that one uh, being uh, mentioned yet. So, Matt, we reached the end. I have just one more question for you. Can you quote <sighs> the famous line, My name is Bond, James Bond. My name is Bond, James Bond. <laughs> All right, that was my chat with Matt Bunnell, which I really hope you've enjoyed. Matt is so passionate about James Bond that I'm afraid he puts way too much time into it. But then again, I spend several hours every day either preparing, recording or editing podcasts, so I really shouldn't judge Matt too harshly. 
I really urge all our listeners to follow Matt's Twitter accounts. If you're not on Twitter, go there now and create an account and make sure you follow Matt, both his Bond Maps account, but especially his JB Univex account, because he'll start going through all the Fleming books again this summer, and you're in for a real treat. And while you're at it, please follow us on Twitter too. We share fun stuff on James Bond every single day. I was really amazed at all the stuff that Matt knows. He mapped out the entire journey through France from Goldfinger, and he knows exactly about the inconsistencies concerning Bond's birthday, and he even knows how many times he eats eggs in each of the novels. It's kind of creepy. So I'll make sure to put all the links to all the sources we've talked about in the show notes. You don't have to remember everything right now, especially if you're currently driving or cycling to work. Stay focused. To round off this podcast, I'm going to play the track Fanfare, which Matt mentioned. And it is the heroic music that you hear in A View to a Kill when Bond is carrying Stacy down the ladder when City Hall is on fire. The track wasn't on the original soundtrack, but I found it on one of my CDs from the City of Prague Philharmonic Orchestra. In fact, it's only the middle section of their medley, which is called Wine with Stacy, Fanfare, Snow Job. So it's really a small clip of music only, but very, very heroic. And afterwards, I put a nice little outtake right at the end. And that brings me to the end of this podcast. If you've enjoyed it, please share it with others. If you want to get in touch, please email us at moneypenny at the double or search for us on social media. Until next time, everybody, the double O files will return. James Bond. Ah, no, there terrible. you go. No, terrible. <laughs> you want to do it again? No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was so much fun. Good stuff. Mm.